All right. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so now what I want to do is give an overview of some of the particle functionality that exists in AMRX. Because so far we've been talking about kind of the mesh-based stuff. Um, so this is going back to the kind of overview of the ecosystem of AMRX-based application codes. And the point I want to make now is so the ones that have a red check mark next to them um, use particles in at least some capacity. So basically all of these codes with two exceptions. And um, also in the examples we're going to get to later uh, in the hands-on, those codes all use particle data as well. So in a lot of cases, what these particles are doing is there's what we call passive tracers. So the particles are kind of following along with the mesh data, uh, but they don't feed back onto the mesh data or like affect the evolution of it. Uh, they're just used for sort of diagnostic purposes in these codes that I'm highlighting now. Um, but in a lot of the codes, we're doing kind of more active particle mesh stuff. So there, the mesh data affects the particles, but then the particles are depositing something back onto a mesh that's affecting its evolution. So like all the all the pick codes, for example, um, are doing things, doing things like this. Um, Finally, so we also have codes that do direct particle-particle work. So for example, in the infix exacode, which was another one of the ECP application development projects, but it was trying to model chemical looping reactors. So you had a colloidal, a colloidal suspension of particles suspended in a fluid flow. Uh, the particles both interact with the fluid via drag forces, and they also interact with each other via direct collisions. So there's uh, AMRX base codes for doing that as well. Um, some advantages of particle methods. So particle methods are naturally adaptive. Um, and the particles kind of go, they naturally tend to cluster where more resolution is needed. Um, they also often closely resemble the underlying physics being modeled. For example, if you're modeling just an in-body problem where each particle is a star, um, or in the colloidal suspension and the discrete element method. Um, and they're often relatively simple to implement uh, compared to compared to grid <clears throat> methods. For example, compare using PIC to solve Vlasov systems compared to doing Eulerian grid-based methods for the same problem. Um, some disadvantages or some challenges, rather, compared to structured grids are that you have this irregular and also dynamic uh, data distributions going on. You also have irregular memory access patterns. Um, for example, when you have particles interacting with the other particles or particles interacting with the mesh data, um, you need to do something in order to establish regularity. Um, and also connectivity information. Um, for example, finding your K nearest neighbor particles or finding all the neighbors that are within a certain distance of each particle. Um, is more complicated than in a structured grid, and you often need to recompute that many times throughout, throughout your simulation. Um, so in AMRX, particles are stored in an object called a particle container, and particle containers are associated with this block structured mesh refinement hierarchy that we've been talking about. So I have a cartoon winch in there on the left, but here I have three levels, um, and each one is kind of this union of boxes. And yeah, in general, these can change dynamically, and um, which has already described our box array class, and then a vector of box array defines the grids at every level of refinement. And for domain decomposition, you know, we would assign those boxes, as Weichen was saying, to different MPI ranks. So here, say yellow is rank zero and blue is rank one. Um, and in general, like the MPI task will be responsible for processing multiple boxes. And so what we have, on, what we have with particles is particles that live on a structure like, like that. So for the particles in AMRX, we, can, we have a flexible data layout. So users can specify however many components of particle data that they want. Um, the components can be known either at compile time or they can be added at runtime. Um, and we also allow users to ask for either an array of struct or struct array layout or some combination of the two. 
So in an array of struct layout, um, you know, all the data for particle one would be next to each other, and then all the data for particle two, and et cetera. Whereas in a struct of array layout, all say the x positions of the particles would be next to each other, and then all the y positions would be next to each other, and um, so on. And so we have a set of these data structures for every grid in the mesh refinement hierarchy stored inside the particle container. Um, so one of the things that we've found as we've you know ported AMRX-based applications to GPUs and done optimization work on them is that we really prefer the structured array layout for the particle data. Um, and one of the reasons is you know, if you like compare these two cases where I have the particle at the top there, I have the particle positions and ID numbers stored in array of struct format. And imagine an operation where we're just trying to read the particle IDs in and do something to them. Well, if we want to read all the particle IDs in for every particle and they're stored in array of struct style, uh, the different GPU threads would not be accessing contiguous memory locations. They'd be offset. Um, basically, this means that you can't do coalesce reads and writes, which is really important for getting good performance on the GPU. Um, it's also the case that if you say, if you were going to read in your, say you only wanted to read in your particle positions, for example, um, and not the rest of the data, well, you're wasting memory bandwidth if you are have your particle data in sort of array of struct style rather than struct of array style. Um, so an example from the impact X code. So impact X is another AMRX using application that does particle accelerator modeling. Um, unlike WarpX, it's for modeling more like conventional particle accelerators. So it's somewhat different physics and numerics, but basically it's doing PIC for particle accelerator modeling. And we converted the whole thing from array of struct to struct of array style. And we plotted there the sort of speed up that we got from doing it on both GPU and CPU for both single and double precision runs. And basically, we're looking, you know, somewhere around the ballpark of like factors of two in terms of just the overall speed up. Um, doing this transition was also really important to getting good performance on Fugaku for WarpX because on Fugaku, uh, getting the compiler to vectorize for you is very important to getting good performance. So, and it not good at doing that unless you're storing this structure array style. So really prefer that data layout. This is another example um, from the infix exacode of doing this same conversion, but you know there's two root line plots that we made there, um, both using array of struct and then after converting the struct of arrays, you can see we're getting much better memory throughput on the GPUs. Uh, this was done on the Perlmutter platform. Um, with the structure of array layout and also uh, moved up on the roof line uh, considerably as a result of doing this. And then that was for a kernel that was calculating collisions between particles and the embedded boundary geometry that was in this chemical looping reactor. But we got similar speed ups from a bunch of kernels throughout the code for doing this transition. And this was work led by Ru Ru Roberto Porcu during a nurse packet on the Perlmutter platform. Um, so in terms of performance portability, so the same functions that Wei Chen has already described, the AMRX parallel for routines um, that work for mesh data, also work for particle data. Um, there's a little code snippet right there that's basically just updating particle positions. But again, we have pointers to our particle data that are getting captured in this uh, host device lambda by value, um, and we're using the 1D form of parallel for here to loop over the particles. So different GPU threads are then processing different um, particles. Um, so a lot of the codes that are using AMRX to do particle stuff are trying to do, or are using doing particle mesh operations. Uh, so we provide a set of tools for handling that. Um, if you're doing common interpolation operation, for example, uh, nearest grid point or cloud and cell, like linear interpolation, 
Um, we just provide those routines. And we also have a Lambda function interface where users, you can write your own interpolation kernel and pass that in. And AMRX will do the operation using your custom kernel for you. So if you want to do like higher order particle shapes, or if you want to do like Gaussian um, smoothing or something like that. Um, these functions also perform all the necessary parallel communication under the hood. So for example, if you have a particle that's here at the corner of two or four <laughs> domains, uh, you can see it could contribute to cells that don't necessarily live on the box or MPI rank it's on. So what it needs to do is it needs to write that data to a ghost cell and then add from that ghost cell to the corresponding valid cell that could live on a different rank. So all that happens automatically for you. Um, we have support for dual grid simulations, which is where the particles have one kind of domain decomposition and the mesh data uses a different type of domain decomposition. So this is important for if you have very inhomogeneous particle distributions um, where they're really clustered on only a small part of the domain. Um, and finally, so when we're, we're implementing the particle mesh operations, we use a data duplication strategy when we're running on CPUs because atomics are particularly expensive there. Uh, but when running on GPUs, the kind of modern, you know, like the A100s from NVIDIA, the MI250X from AMD, actually had very fast hardware support for uh, atomic operations. So we actually are using atomics per particle to accumulate, uh, to do the particle mesh interpolation there, and it, and it performs pretty well. We also have tools for building and iterating over neighbor lists that do uh, molecular dynamic style particle-particle interactions. So this is when you pre-compute a list of potential interaction partners that could be reused for multiple time steps. You say grab all the particles that are within a certain distance of me and keep track of that so that we don't have to keep pre-computing neighbors. Um, this uses a cell list to avoid a direct n squared search over all possible pairs. Um, users again specify the operation. They, you know, the operation that says whether two particles could collide with each other uh, by passing in their own custom lambda functions. And we have support for both full and half neighbor lists. So basically, uh, do you have does particle I keep track of? all of the ones it's going to collide with, or does it rely on the fact that it will also be in some of its neighbors' neighbor list? So this is kind of a trade out between the amount of thread contention you're going to get and the atomics performance. Um, because when you process a half neighbor list, you need to do atomics to do your updates. Um, so for mfix exa, uh, uh, usually we find that the half neighbor list performs best, again, at least on these modern GPUs that have uh, good hardware support for atomics. So we support a few different um, communication patterns that come up when you're doing particle simulations a lot. So one of them is just redistribution. So this is the particles were all assigned to some MPI rank, uh, and then they changed their positions, and so they could have moved to a different box and not need to be put back on the right place. Um, so there's a function in AMRx called redistribute that just does that operation for you. Um, this is a harder, this is a harder problem in some ways than communicating, uh, the mesh data, even, even when you have an adaptive mesh, um, because in order to do it, you have to actually look at all the particle data. You can't just look at where the boxes are. You have to examine all the particle positions and see where they belong. Um, so we provide like GPU optimized versions of this operation, meaning it doesn't launch a bunch of tiny GPU kernels. It doesn't unnecessarily copy data off the device. And in fact, if you have a uh, GPU aware MPI implementation available, um, it can take advantage of that. And, you know, unless the GPU aware MPI is copying things off the device under the hood, the data would just all be resident on the device. Um, and again, this, so this comes in both local flavors where the particles only moved a certain distance, like one cell since the last time you called redistribute, or global 
flavors where the particle is going to jump anywhere in the domain. Um, so there's some wrinkles for when you're doing redistribution in the context of a subcycling algorithm, because maybe you're going to take two of these finest level time steps for every one coarse level kinds time step. So in that case, just because a particle has moved off of this finest grid on one time step, that doesn't mean you want to immediately put it on the course level because it might not be at the same time yet. So there's options to do like fine grain control, like, hey, keep this particle on the fine level because it's not at the same time as course level yet. Um, there's options for doing that in the context of these subcycling algorithms. And then we also have a concept of ghost and virtual particles, which represent particles that live uh, on coarser or on finer levels, respectively. Um, and I will I'll actually skip this slide because it doesn't come up super often. But so the other, the other main communication pattern that comes up when you're doing particle operations is that you need to uh, do a halo exchange. So you need to grab copies of particles that are close to you and contain, because they could potentially say go on the neighbor list for a particle that's local to your box. Um, so again, as with redistribution, we provide a version of this operation that uh, runs fully on the device. And there's also op, you know, advanced options for culling particles that don't belong in any neighbor list. Uh, so that you're not having to communicate extra data. Um, these are some scaling results for our particle communication routines. So this was actually done on, on Summit, but it's a problem where we essentially make up a bunch of particles and move them around randomly and then put them back in the right place after every time step. Um, and we have both runs where we had no mesh refinement and then runs where we have mesh refinement. And we you know, did this benchmark, the, the sort of red dotted line here is the number of nodes. That's like the full summit system. Um, so we actually see pretty good weak scaling after, you know, after we've kind of saturated the amount of communication work we're doing. Uh, the weak scaling is pretty flat going up to the full size of the, of the summit system. Um, and this particular benchmark used one particle per cell, again, moving randomly for 500 time steps. And with particle data, that is a mix of array of struct and struct of array. Um, we also have tools for binning and sorting and partitioning the particles on a given box. And by those terms, binning, I mean, compute a permutation array that puts the particles in some order. And then sorting, I mean, use that permutation array to actually reorder the particle data in memory. Um, and then for partition, that's something that's a little bit weaker than sorting, just means splitting particles on a box into two different groups. Um, and all of these are implemented in terms of accounting sort, uh, which relies on having this fast and performance portable prefix sum operation that Wei Chen mentioned. Um, so this, these operations are used internally all the time, like when redistributing particles or building neighbor lists, uh, or they can be used to implement application-specific physics modules. Um, for example, binary collisions uh, or algorithmic options. So uh, for example, gather or deposit buffers. So if, you have, if you're doing mesh refinement and you want particles that are near course find boundaries to do something special, we can use our partition to put the particles in two different groups and then call it different numerical options for the ones that are near the course find boundaries. Of those are. Um, yeah, so we can, we can do binning or sorting based on kind of arbitrary user functions that define how you want to map particle position to bins. You can sort the particles by cells or by two by two supercells or into sort of strips such as this image on the right. Um, an example of where sorting comes up is to improve particle mesh performance. So uh, 
what you want to do is, so if you have particles that are very disordered in memory, um, that means that you're not writing. So you're, you're reading in a bunch of particles and then you're writing to very different memory locations when you try to do your particle mesh deposition operation. Um, and that ends up being very slow. Whereas if you were to periodically sort your particles such that ones that are close together in memory are also likely to talk to the same cells or cells that are close together in memory, um, the performance is a lot better. And the image on the uh, left here is kind of showing the overall speed up between not sorting at all and then doing this optimal sorting. Um, and you can see that it's, you know, it's up to a factor of like seven, I think that is, um, versus sorting optimally and, or eight, it's eight times between sorting optimally and not sorting. And if we do a roof line analysis on this, um, we can see a few things. One, yeah, the overall performance gets a lot better when we sort versus when we don't sort. And this also shows the reason because you can see from comparing uh, the memory bandwidth that you get between HBM and the streaming multiprocessors versus L2 cache and streaming multiprocessors and L1 cache, you can see we're actually getting a lot of cache reuse in L2 when we do this sorting operation compared to when we not. That, that's basically the difference between the square and the triangle on this plot. So yeah, doing this really is important for particle mesh performance. And the reason is because it gets you better L2 cache reuse. Um, as with uh, the mesh data that Weishin was talking about, you can also do global reductions over particle data. So this code snippet here, what this is doing is it's computing the, I believe, total, yes, yeah, the total kinetic energy of all the photons in a simulation. And the same code will run on CPU platforms and it will use open MP threading to perform the reductions, or it'll work on GPU platforms where it'll, uh, yeah, it'll accelerate using the GPUs. Um, this is another use of prefix sum basically, but we provide a variety of stream compaction functions for doing filter or copy or transformation operations on particle data. And these are useful for implementing processes where one type of particle conditionally creates one or more other particles, possibly of a different type. And there's a bunch of examples of operations like this. So ionization, is one um, where an ion is turning into a different type of ion and also creating a free electron. Um, particle splitting, uh, QED operations like pair production or quantum secretron radiation, um, all can be implemented in terms of this type of operation. And these operations can be triggered by an interaction with the mesh data, say like, in regions where the electromagnetic fields are strong enough, you might want to start doing pair production, or they could be triggered by interaction with the embedded boundary uh, geometry as well. 